Welcome, Excellencies, members of Parliament. I know we have some senators still coming, special guests. Welcome to our Christian Embassy luncheon focused on Canadian agriculture. Nous vous souhaitons tous la bienvenue, chers invités distingués. I'll tell you a little bit about the Christian Embassy. We have been inspiring diplomatic, parliamentary, and professional leaders in Ottawa since 1984, including facilitating networking nationally and internationally, encouraging one-on-one, -on -one, organizing small or large group events like these ones, offering English classes, and many other events based on those needs that you express. We are motivated by God's love and seek to be transformed by his life and the words of Jesus. And so we, like our associates in 12 or over 12 national capitals, um, love to serve you as leaders. L'ambassade chrétienne existe afin de vous encourager et de vous inspirer. Nous sommes motivés par l'amour de Dieu. Nous vous offrons des ressources en plusieurs langues avec quelques copies à l'extérieur de la salle. It's my honor to introduce our guest speaker today. I've known Ian for a number of years, but I got a couple of things I got to tell you that I didn't know about him, so just bear with me as I read this. Ian Ross is the president and the CEO of Grand Valley Fortifiers, a group of companies. For 63 years, Grand Valley Fortifiers has empowered Canada's farmers to increase both the nutritional value and the economic and commercial value of their meat, milk, and eggs. With significant investment in raised without antibiotics, organic, and omega-3 enriched feeding programs. I love their stated foundational purpose. It's, this is it, quote, with gratitude for the Lord's direction and blessing to generously share with our staff and to give generously to the spread of the gospel for relief of the poor, the sick, and the hungry. Ian earned a Bachelor of Business Administration honors from the Trinity Western University. He also served as a member, a number of industry and Christian charity boards including Faith Orphans Fund, Heritage College and Seminary, Livestock Research and Innovation Corporation, and SEEDS, which is an anti-human trafficking organization that supports and assists in the restoration of sex traffic survivors. I'm honored to know and have been a friend of Ian for many years and as a partner in God's work. GVF, Grand Valley Fortifiers, has a stellar reputation in our agricultural community. And I know that we will all be enriched by what Ian has to share with us today. So, Ian, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Just a little bit about the GVF group of companies and this company I have the privilege of leading. Um, we are uh, focused on profitable farms, healthy food, and improved lives. And we have the opportunity to work directly with uh, primary producers, farmers across this great country uh, from pretty much coast to coast. Ours is a Canadian family owned and operated company. Uh, here pictured is my late father, Jim Ross, and my brother, uh, David, who's joined us uh, today, as previously introduced. And um, ours is a company that was founded back in 1960 uh, in the then town, uh, town called Galt, now Cambridge, Ontario. And uh, as you can tell, it was a local feed mill, converted barn, originally a Prina dealership uh, for the first five years of its existence. And then in the early 70s, we changed our name to Grand Valley Fortifiers and later on the GVF group of companies. As Harold said, uh, when we look at my father who planned to be a farmer his whole career, but uh, the local feed mill closed and he was wondering where he and his neighboring farmers were going to get feed, he started uh, Grand Valley Feed and Farm Supply uh, to serve those needs. And whether he stayed, remained a farmer or whether he uh, launched this company uh, so many years ago, we believe that the reason for what he was doing would remain the same. And that is with gratitude for the Lord's direction and blessing to faithfully share with their staff and give generously for the spread of the gospel, relief of the poor, the sick, and the hungry. That, of course, is not what we do every day. What we do every day is we try to empower farmers to produce meat, milk, and eggs profitably and sustainably for the advancement of human lives, nutrition, and health. With the context of that uh, purpose statement, uh, we endeavor to continue to lead the company and have our staff function as my father would have them function uh, with the values that he solidified within the organization. That being a passion to serve customers innovatively and well, leading with humble confidence, integrity, professionalism, 
and caring with a true servant's heart for both co-workers and customers alike. But that's not really what we're here to talk about today. We're talking about a very big subject, uh, and I'm going to do my best to shed a few perspectives and insights on the growing tension between our job to feed the world and save the planet. Back in Genesis uh, 1, 27 28, it states, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so this was some of our early instructions from the creator, Lord God, that we serve. When we look at United Nations information, uh, it seems like we have, in fact, followed the Lord's instruction fairly well as we see that the 2050 population is estimated to be 9.8 billion, and obviously back uh, up to 11 billion by 2100. 20, so that's the fill the earth and, and uh, multiply and fill the earth. It also says to subdue it, and it's not a word that we use in English uh, all that often anymore. So I went to Rick Reed, the, the president of Heritage College and Seminary, and asked, you know, what did that really mean in the Hebrew or in the Greek? And he said, well, it might paraphrase as follows, harness its potential, use its resources for our benefit. And in ancient Israel context, this would be suggesting cultivating fields, mine, um, mining the mineral riches, using trees for construction, and domesticating its animals. Again, in the context of that verse, so again, it said, the Lord created man, both male and female, in his image. So as humans, were to, we are the pinnacle of his creative work as we image or represent God on earth. And so under his rule, we humans have oversight or dominion on the earth. But their dominion and rule is designed to image the way God rules his creation. God carefully crafts and sovereignly sustains all he's made. And we can see that in verses in Psalms like 8 and 145. And um, so humans are to rule over creation in a way that stewards it well under God's rule as God would his own creation. Also in Genesis, we read that God saw everything he'd made and behold, it was very good. At the same time throughout scripture, we see many uh, references to feeding the poor and feeding the hungry. And as we uh, see what's happening around the world, um, we know that uh, just from 2019 to 2020, that uh, we had a 1.5% increase in the number of hungry or undernourished people on this globe, almost 10% of its global population. And again, uh, FAO uh, recently estimated about 850 million people are chronically hungry and even more suffer from nutritional inadequacy, about one billion actually. And that inadequate uh, nutritional inadequacy is really often coming from protein intake. We often talk about protein intake and crude protein. We see crude protein measurements on the food that we eat and the labels that we read. Um, it is in fact a crude measurement, hence the term. And um, so this paper came out just uh, in um, 2021 in June, looking at in fact crude protein versus digestible protein. This is a tough data set to see from very far away, but each bar on that graph, or those graphs, represents a country. The horizontal line, the average protein uh, requirement uh, for a human. The green bars being uh, vegetable proteins, the red bars being uh, animal proteins. And so on a crude protein basis, it looks like almost all the countries in the world represented on the graph are exceeding their daily recommended intake of protein. But once corrected for digestibility, in fact, many countries fall below the average daily recommended intake. And if we go even further and correct for amino acid profile, really the building blocks of, of protein, um, you can see that we, uh, many countries fall below, below that requirement. So why are we saying this? Well, again, we don't actually digest crude protein. We digest uh, amino acids within those proteins. And so milk and whey protein isolate, and beef and so soy protein isolate, these are highly digestible forms of protein. But when we look at some of the whole grains and wheat and peanuts and so on on the um, uh, far side of the graph, you can see that the digestibility actually decreases substantially. So when you start looking at essential amino acids as the uh, key to quality assessment of proteins, we start to recognize that beef and milk production actually require less land than beans and peas when compared on that ess essential amino acid basis. So the FAO says, you know, livestock are key drivers for, for sustainable development in agriculture. They clearly contribute to food security, I'll say protein security, uh, nutrition, poverty alleviation, and economic growth. That being said, probably almost every week we'll see headlines like this, avoiding meat and dairy is the single biggest way to reduce your impact on the earth. So what about Canada? Where are we faring right now? I think many people recognize that we represent roughly 2% of the GHG emissions of the world, 
And of that 2%, agriculture in Canada represents roughly 10%. Within the agricultural uh, piece of the pie, uh, livestock production represents about half, i.e. Uh, 5% of total emissions. And how are we faring as a country? Well, looking at 2005 data, we had about 732 megatons of uh, GHG emissions in this country. And you can see what happens over the time frame up to 2021, some ups and downs, most recently about 670 megatons of GHG emissions in total. What about the ag sector? Well, as we said just a few minutes ago, roughly 10%. So in 2021, that was 68.6 .6 megatons on the yellow bar at the top, that's total. Um, you'll note that uh, that yellow line is in fact increasing. But what most people don't realize is the increases are actually coming from crop production and on-farm fuel emissions, not from livestock production. In fact, there's been an 18% decrease in GHG emissions on livestock production in this country over that time frame. Still, bill on as headlines abound, especially on cattle, the ruminant side. Uh, this is Time Magazine uh, back in 2021. Cows are the new coal. And again, there's science on every side of the uh, discussion on these types of topics. And we do have to recognize that climate crusaders and animal activists do commission studies as well. There may even be some attempts for some blame shifting from the energy sector, because we know uh, the percentage that they represent on GHG uh, in this country. But again, it's just, I think the danger is all of us are very apt, myself included, to just read headlines. We don't actually read the whole article. And uh, the headline is just to get you to read the article. Um, so we need to look past the headlines. And it's really, I, I believe, time to change the narrative. Back in October 2022, in the Societal Toro of Meat Summit in Dublin, Ireland, the declaration, the Dublin Declaration was uh, launched. And this declaration aims to give voice to the many scientists around the world who research diligently, honestly, and successfully in the various disciplines in order to achieve a balanced view of the future of animal agriculture. They state in the opening lines, they are too precious, these livestock systems, to become the victim of simplification, reductionism, and zealotry. It's a wonderful declaration. It's a one-pager. We don't have time to read it today, but I'd encourage you to go online and look it up. But they close the declaration, quoting the UN uh, Food Systems Summit 2021. Human civilization has been built on livestock from initiating the Bronze Age more than 5,000 years ago toward being the bedrock of food security for modern societies today. Livestock is the millennia long proven method to create healthy nutrition, secure livelihoods, a wisdom deeply embedded in cultural values everywhere. Sustainable livestock will also provide solutions for the additional challenge of today to stay within safe operating zone of the planet Earth's boundaries, the only Earth we have. And to date, there's over a thousand scientists globally that have signed on to the Dublin Declaration. So we know from some of the stats that I've been showing you that meat, milk, and eggs are key sources of digestible amino acids rich protein. However, aren't meat, milk, and eggs environmentally intense sources of that digestible protein? Again, most of the information that we tend to see uh, at a high level is uh, based on crude protein basis, right? So GHG emissions per ton of crude protein, you can see that eggs, pork, milk in this graph are in fact uh, more intense than wheat, rice, and maize, or corn, as we would say in this country. Um, once corrected for digestible lysine, however, you can see the bars change substantively, and in fact, eggs and pork are more uh, or less intense uh, GHG emitters per kilogram of digestible lysine uh, produced than rice and maize, for instance. Now, we don't just live on protein alone. Um, vitamins and minerals, uh, key to our business, are also key to human health. And uh, not surprisingly, knowing as we do that vitamin mineral concentrations within meat, milk, and eggs are quite dense and high, uh, that on a, on a GHG footprint um, uh, comparative basis, we're sourcing a third of what a typical adult requires for iron, zinc, calcium, folate, vitamins A and B12, that in fact uh, meat, milk and eggs are much more environmentally um, less intense than say grains. Okay, then there's another argument. Well, yes, but aren't animals eating my food and aren't they pretty inefficient converters, especially on the beef side? Well, number one, 86% of what animals consume globally uh, is in inedible by humans. We are not ruminants. We cannot digest hay and grass and so on. Uh, we have to you know, digest things like corn and soybean and so on. And so, in fact, livestock are, particularly cattle, are well-suited to upcycle inedible raw materials into high-quality protein, nutrient-rich foods, as we've seen in previous graphs. And in actual fact, these animals are eating your food waste and biofuel waste. 
In fact, in North America, dairy cattle consume about 40 million metric tons of byproducts like distiller's grains from ethanol or alcohol production. And, um, and yes, there's some methane emissions associated with that consumption and just the biological function of the cow. And so, yes, in this, in this uh, table, about 70 grams per kilogram of byproduct is emitted as methane. However, if we chose to compost uh, instead of feeding to cattle, that number would be five times as much. And if we landfilled those same products, those byproducts, it would be 50 times as much. So um, from an emission standpoint, actually cattle are upregulating, upcycling uh, inedible products that uh, then turn into milk and beef uh, for human consumption. And again, some people that uh, are sort of looking at this, again, look at, um, say, the amount of feed it takes to provide, uh, say, a kilo of beef. And it's about almost 14 kilos of feed to provide a kilo of beef about 1.1 for a kilo of milk, and 1.6 for boiler chickens, and pork 2.5. So again, the ruminant is always accused of being a very inefficient converter. However, again, if we uh, correct for the only human edible portions of the diet, suddenly a beef cow becomes very efficient and is neck and neck with a broiler chicken. I think the other narrative is, as we have to feed more people, there's a lot more cattle globally. Well, in fact, over um, from 2012 to 2022, over that 10-year uh, period, there's been only a 0.8% increase in cattle globally. What about in this country? Well, hog numbers are pretty flat uh, over that similar time frame, um, as you can see on the top left. Canadian poultry production continues to increase. We always joke in the industry, death taxes and people eating more chicken are the three guarantees in life. Um, and so we continue to see that graph uh, continue to uh, escalate. That being said, Canadian cattle numbers, uh, again, Stats Canada, you can see what's happening there uh, with decreasing uh, numbers or flat numbers on the left-hand side. And yet, Canadian milk production continues to increase. And you say, well, how can that possibly be? Well, in fact, the dairy cow is getting more and more efficient through genetics and through good nutrition and uh, understanding of how to feed those cows. This is not through hormones or growth promotants, um, but you can see from 2011, we moved from on average 26.6 uh, liters per day all the way to 35.6 liters per day over that time frame. So we're, we continue to improve. I think sadly, as we go back to the question about feeding the world, I think uh, developed nations food production is in a sort of a reductionist environment for a host of reasons, of course. COVID shutdown related supply chain impacts, geopolitical unrest, civil unrest, multilateral agreement breakdowns, foreign animal diseases, uh, which are circling the globe a little bit easier with travel and so on. Food for green energy production, Expensive feedstuffs resulting in tight or negative margins for livestock producers around the world. And so many farmers are getting out. I think you may have read the headlines just in the last number of weeks that RBC was uh, uh, suggesting in the next 10 years in Canada, 40% of farmers will retire. Uh, so we have a huge generational chance for coming in the next five to 10 years, even within this country. And then of course, developed nations reduction agenda in some cases for achievement of national GHG emission targets. No doubt we've been following what's been going on in the Netherlands uh, with the uh, anticipated close down of 3,000 farms. There's roughly 30,000 farms in the Netherlands, so this is about 10% of their farms. And notwithstanding many tractor protests and farmer protests, um, just uh, early this month, the EU approved the Dutch plan to forcibly close down farms. This seems incredibly ironic uh, and sad to me because back in 2004, um, there was a super cluster kind of approach uh, within the Netherlands with universities and private companies, government support, um, which uh, all worked together to in fact successfully drive the Netherlands to be the second largest food exporter of ag products in the world next to the United States with a lot less land. Um, the Netherlands only has 3% of the arable land of Canada and yet they're doing 60% of Canada's annual agricultural GDP. So we know all these factors are causing uh, uh, world food prices to rise. And on top of that, we have all these voluntary commitments and government commitments to sustainability and scope three emissions uh, targets for the major food companies of the world, which will filter eventually right down to the farm primary producing level. And we know in this country, the Canadian government's pledged uh, to cut emissions by 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. And of course, uh, our biggest food companies are um, making commitments themselves as well as associations like the Dairy Farmers of Canada. Ted Billier, uh, in a recent um, conference here in Ottawa, uh, stated, 
we need to, to ensure that we do no harm onto production while we're doing good on the climate scene. The reason I say that is because whatever we don't produce here is going to produce somewhere else that's a lot more carbon intensive and a lot worse for everyone. And so the reality is if developed nations actually reduce and reduce uh, production of protein-rich foods, um, they will need to be produced elsewhere. And we need to see that kind of uh, agricultural development around the world, of course. But we have to recognize that, in fact, the CO2 emissions per kilo will actually increase and animal welfare will decrease uh, because many of these uh, nations don't have the codes of practice that have been uh, instilled in Western Europe and, of course, in North America as well. And the reality is that Canada is already one of the most efficient producers of meat, milk, and eggs in the world. On pork, uh, we're just neck and neck with the Russian Federation um, on, on, on emissions per kilo of pork produced. On beef, uh, we are in the top 10, um, much more efficient than uh, China, Brazil, even US and India, but um, still trailing behind New Zealand, Ireland, Italy, Uruguay, Japan, and UK. What about the chicken front? I think many of us feel as Canadians that uh, the supply management system allows inefficiencies to abound within, uh, say, chicken production. Well, in fact, we're already um, the most efficient chicken producer in the world um, when you look at next to the, some of the regions on the graph. What about milk? Again, a supply, major, uh, supply managed environment. Well, North America on the far left of the graph is, uh, in fact, the most efficient on a GHG basis. And Canada, of course, falls within that. Even, um, and that's, sorry, this is, 2000, this is 2010 FAO data. This graph is from 2011 to 2016, and you can see the 7% uh, improvement uh, of, of efficiency of milk production on a GHG basis here in Canada. And you saw the earlier graph, what's happened since 2016 all the way to today on milk per cow per day, which also is an efficiency measurement. What about egg production? Well, back in 1947, you were on average probably getting 150 eggs per hen per year. Today, it's more like 340 eggs, i.e. almost an egg a day. And when we look at the sustainability index uh, for Canada, again, we're about 70% better than the global average for efficiency on egg production. But in the egg industry, we know we can do better. And we need to do better by deploying science and technology. Um, you've probably read about 3NOP. Uh, this is the trade name. DSM is the owner of that IP. They're trade naming at Bouvier, at least globally. This is not approved in Canada yet. But this uh, feed ingredient promises 30% reduction in dairy uh, cow emissions and 45% reduction in beef cow emissions. Uh, this being said, and I need to me read more about this, um, this is a basically a methane uh, inhibitor. It doesn't do a lot for um, feed efficiency, um, whereas agalin, which only promises 10 to 13 uh, percent reduction in methane emissions, also improves feed conversion, feed efficiency, and so there's a pickup there as well. We have to recognize that feed for livestock, the business that we're primarily in, uh, represents 70 to 80 percent of GHG emissions per kilo of I'll say protein produced. It also is, in fact, the 70-80% of the cost of production. And so if actually farmers are mutually motivated to become more sustainable because in their attempts to be more efficient and more profitable, they will in fact be more sustainable. And that's what we're working with our producer, producers on going forward. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is uh, Internet of Things, real-time feed conversion calculations for swine and dairy and beef. Uh, you would think as the biggest cost that producers would know this day by day, but in fact, they do not. Um, so we're looking at some new technology in that regard. And at GVF Group of Companies, we say we don't want to feed less animals more. We want to feed more animals with less. Then there's the whole sequestration story. And again, what other sector can you think of that owns and manages millions of acres and billions of trees? I can't think of one. And in this country, we have a landmass of 2.5 billion acres, the second largest country in the world. Of that, we have about 900 million acres of forest about 154 million acres of arable land, about 190,000 farms in this country. And you can see how the land mass, arable land mass breaks down on this slide. So we have millions of acres of potential sequestration. We're heartened to see uh, the comments from the expert panel on Canada's carbon sink potential, December 2022, that cropland management and avoided grassland conversion holds the greatest potential for carbon sequestration in agriculture and grasslands. So we need to work together toward maximize uh, sequestration and maximize nature-based solutions. We're still figuring out how to measure, report, and verify on that basis. But to get your head around it a little bit, this is just an example. Uh, assume for a minute that there's a 150-acre uh, pasture farm 
uh, with 80, sorry, 50 mother cows and 80 young cows. Well, probably 80 megaton, uh, tons, sorry, tons of carbon would be emitted uh, from that those livestock per year. Add to that the tractors and equipment running on that farm, there's maybe another 32 tons. Um, but what if that 150 acres actually sequesters 500 tons of carbon? That farm would be net negative 388 per year. And we're hopeful, and I know the Canadian government's working on this, that uh, we'll establish some way of measuring this in a very um, uh, you know, judicious manner, and that, uh, in fact, there could be carbon credits available uh, to our efficient farmers in this country. So we'd like to change the narrative and say we're the proud participants in the largest carbon sequestration industry in the world. And in fact, Canadian agriculture can be ground zero for net zero. Canada, uh, we know has a relatively small population given its land mass. Uh, we've got lots of sequestration available through that land mass, abundant fresh water, um, millions of hectares of forests as well. We are a creator and adopter of technology. I think we have the massive opportunity, the bread basket and protein charcuterie, if you will, for the worldwide growing a robust rural and urban economy. I believe we also have a moral, even biblical obligation to feed the poor and the hungry in the most sustainable, cost-efficient manner available globally. Another verse in the Bible from Luke 12, 48 is, to whom much is given, much is required. And again, we have been instructed to feed the hungry and feed the poor. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, a nation becomes strong when it cares for the weak, it becomes rich when it cares for the poor, and it becomes invulnerable when it cares for the vulnerable. Another quote from Ted is, you know, as Canadians, we often set out to do good or look good, but sometimes that gets in the way of doing the right thing. And so from our perspective, what is the right thing to do? I think become the most sustainable producer of meat, milk, and eggs, oil, seeds, and grain in the world. Maximize the production of digestible protein in order to help feed the world. Enact government policies that encourage and finance much greater productivity and production in an increasingly GHG efficient manner. And invest in infrastructure, cost, and time efficient transport to Canadian and global populations through roads, rails, and ports. And again, that was spoken of way back in 2017 in the Dominic Barton report. Encourage agricultural uh, food capacity expansion, facility modernization, and technology development, and adoption through ease of access to capital, both at the processing level and at the primary production level on the farm. And lastly, develop and agree upon sequestration metrics and measurements that encourage sequestration, maximizing management practices through education carbon credits, and allow farmland and crown land to take credit where credit is due. And that is why we titled this talk, Canadian Agriculture, A Force for Food and a Force for Good. Thank you so much for your time and attention. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Don Buckingham, who was raised on a farm in Saskatchewan, passionate about agriculture and agricultural policy. As you heard already, he's a policy consultant in the areas of food, agriculture, administrative law, environmental law, and uh, has been involved in this field for 35 years. He's an adjunct professor at Trinity Western University. Um, he's a consultant. He's acted as a CEO of the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, CAPI, which you heard about. And prior to that was chairperson and CEO of the Canada Agricultural Review Tribunal. In November 2021, he was inducted into the Canadian Agricultural Hall of Fame. I'm guessing you didn't know that existed, but it's because of his lifelong contribution to the development of rules, structures, processes, policy to support, to support sustainable and productive agriculture and agri-food sector in Canada. So he will now verbalize your questions and offer thanks to Mr. Ross. So please welcome Mr. Don Buckingham. Thank you, Darlene. This is uh, such a pleasure to be here today. And, and as we eat good food and I see the questions rolling in, we know this is a topic of current and substantial interest. So thank you for your questions. I think everyone has a dialogue every day about food, whether it's what to have for breakfast or what to do about hunger in the world. So uh, the questions that came in for Ian range from the very, very, very general to the very, very specific. And so I've uh, uh, curated a few of those questions and we're going to uh, present those to Ian and see how he does on the hot seat. I always thought it was death, taxes, and lawyers, but he has proved that it is death, taxes, and eating more chicken as we had our lunch today. So without any further ado, the first question 
it is of the more general nature. What is the greatest single threat to world food security today? I think probably people would anticipate, I would say, climate change. Um, if you look historically um, around the world, where we saw countries that used to be bread baskets that are not, we'll switch, thank you. I would venture to say with rare exemption, it has more to do with government policy and, and conflict than it does to do with climate change. Um, that's not to you know, belittle climate change, um, but I think in reality, historically, that is in fact the biggest challenge. We look, Ukraine's been a bread basket, as we know, um, obviously severely challenged right now. Zimbabwe used to be a bread basket as well uh, for all of uh, Africa, and that changed uh, over the years as well. So I actually think government policy and conflict and uh, social unrest is the biggest challenge to uh, production. So from the very general to the very specific, you talked a lot about um, the uh, way in which we have um, animal protein, which is produced very efficiently in Canada, and that we have the possibility of using those uh, food production systems for uh, using human um, byproducts and, and for, for feed and, and biodigestion. What about the whole problem with food waste and food waste as a world foods issue? Yeah, a great question. Um, I think what I was trying to say was that uh, livestock, especially ruminants, are very adept at um, converting food waste into, again, protein-rich foods. That being said, we do in developed countries have an incredible food waste problem. I'm trying to recall the stats, but I think in Canada it's about 30% of what we produce uh, is in fact wasted on the human side. Uh, then again, we, we talked briefly about, say, ethanol production, the amount of DDGs that are produced in ethanol production. And, um, and so again, really the livestock industry is called upon to deal with that um, because again, humans aren't going to consume uh, corn distillers grains. So yeah, it's, it's certainly a, a, an ongoing challenge um, in terms of how do we better utilize the food that we do produce for humans and not waste it. Uh, but that's uh, kind of outside the scope of agriculture. Thanks, Ian. Now we're going to go to uh, a more polemic kind of question, something that is of great interest to ambassadors and to elected officials. Why is the information that you shared so little known in general circles? And do you feel that your knowledge is sufficiently well presented and documented so that it can help political leaders and policymakers? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I'm not a, a, sort of any political stripes up here, so I'm just going to say what I truly think. Um, you know, as I said briefly in the talk, there's science on every side of the argument that can be well supported. I think in reality what ends up getting published in mainstream um, sort of circles and, and media is that which um, the curators want to be published. and. Uh, and thereby, you know, and, and I've seen it firsthand, we had the unfortunate situation of being involved with a PED outbreak here in this country. And CFI did amazing science, it was great epidemiology that no one ever saw or heard about. Uh, what they heard about was the supplier of the ingredient that was in fact tainted, proving all that it couldn't have been, um, you know, their fault. And so I had, for, you know, front row seats since of something like that. And again, I, you know, congratulations to CFI because they did amazing work, but no one really saw it, and to this day, um, many people in the feed industry don't believe that, in fact, PED came through feed when it did. So, going back to the very specific, um, can you give us a few more details about the um, costs and food safety aspects of the new food additives and feed additives that are being proposed for reductions of methane in agriculture? Yeah, another great question. Um, you know, as I said in the talk, um, Bovier or 3 NOP is not approved for use in Canada, so I don't know the, uh, the retail value of that yet. Um, but what I was saying is if it's purely a methane reducer and not a feed efficiency improver, then there will be no return on investment for the farmer unless there's a carbon credit opportunity. 
And so farmers will not adopt that technology unless there's a reason from a financial standpoint to do so. And so this is where, again, we're hopeful that um, if they can reduce emissions and maximize sequestration, that they will be um, able to cap capture carbon credit um, on their own farms and thereby pay for uh, said ingredient. Um, some of the ingredients, like agalin I mentioned, uh, improves efficiency, and so I'm told, I haven't seen enough data on it, but uh, that the feed efficiency will pay for the product and, and the, uh, hopefully, and then some. And, uh, and then the reduced methane emissions is sort of comes along for the ride. Um, but this is where, again, as a country and, and on the regulatory side, we have to figure out how to incent uh, farmers um, uh, to do these sorts of things for the betterment, obviously, of the industry and the country. Um, but I think there's a quote I saw somewhere, you know, farmers do what you pay, not what you say. So two final questions. One is, what is um, the future of our trade uh, agreements in light of new environmental uh, potential regulation and new environmental non-tariff barriers? Um, yeah, great. Um, you know, we all know that uh, we talk about the rules-based sort of trade system breaking down, multilateral agreements breaking down, and much more bilateral agreements going on. And sadly, I don't think Canada has a lot of experience in that. So I think in some ways we're lagging behind. I guess I'll take the optimistic view and say if we were the most sustainable or are the most sustainable producer of meat, milk, and eggs, as an example, uh, or grains, oil seeds, um, that that would actually give us a leg up for bilateral agreements that would help expand our international trade as various countries are supportive of those targets and so on. Um, so I'm hopeful on that. Um, but um, again, no easy answer on international trade and all the dynamics thereof. Which are changeling hourly. Uh, so on uh, the last question, I, th I think it's a, a poignant one given your uh, prologue uh, to the presentation about your Christian walk and about our, our obligations as, as Christians and as uh, world citizens. What would be the responsibility, in your opinion, of um, negotiating sharing agreements for technology that had been developed in Western countries that would assist agriculture in developing countries with respect to objectives like uh, in improving efficiencies and new genetics? Yeah, I think that, um, again, we have not just a moral obligation to help share our actual produce, our, our proteins, if you will, um, with the less uh, developed and, and more hungry, um, but we also have an obligation to share our technology. I think where I struggle a little bit is um, sometimes I view, um, maybe a government's view is that, you know, we should just share the technology and, and you know, cut our emissions by reducing our actual production. I think the reality is the technology investment will stop and we'll fall behind if we don't have a robust, um, in this case, agri-food um, industry and economy within this country, and we'll quickly fall behind. And I think we've seen that happen. I mean, the UK used to be, you know, very much the pinnacle of at least, I'll say, swine production. All the genetics come from the UK. You know, Canada actually, you know, pulled them over and, uh, and further developed them, I would say. And as we know, we were selling lots of breeding stock to Russia as they were building, rebuilding after perestroika. Um, to be more self-sufficient self on agriculture, and we had the opportunity to help feed some of those Canadian genetics in Russia for a time. Um, but again, once you start uh, removing the economic benefit, the investment, the cap access to capital to an industry, um, the technology development goes elsewhere. And so we'll quickly not be in a position of exporting our technology if we don't have a robust growing economy in agri-food here in this country. And so. Uh, you know, I think, yes, we have an obligation to uh, export that what we know and help customer, um, countries and nations develop their agri-food industries and be more self-sufficient. But we've got to do that within an environment of us having a very, again, robust and growing uh, agri-food economy here. Thank you, Ian. We weren't be able to stump him with any of the questions. So thank you very much for your questions. Merci mille fois pour uh, votre, vos questions et pour votre attention. And my thanks as well to Mr. Buckingham for uh, being expressing your questions. I know there's probably many more, but we do want to respect time and the reality that you have other programs happening also. We do want to express our 
deep thanks to each of you because as we were discussing at our table, the success of an event is not only the content and the speaker, but it's the presence of each and every one here. So we are honored by your presence and uh, we trust that this has been a, a good afternoon for you. And um, again, Ian has many stories to share. I, in fact, that would be one of the things I guess I would have loved to ask. He is very involved, and as a company, they are too, as they shared in, in just um, making a difference for, for those without. And I don't know, Ian, could you tell us a little bit more about that? He said that even yesterday as he flew here, he was greeting a group from Zambia, I believe. Would you have a moment just to share that? And then we'll close. And um, my family has a sort of deep-rooted history in Africa. Um, my grandmother was a um, uh, Charles Spurgeon orphanage uh, attendee uh, in London, England, way back um, after uh, World War I, and became a midwife in Nigeria, uh, and met her Scottish husband there, and um, had kids. So my mom was born in Cape Town, and um, grew up in Nigeria until she was about nine, and then came to Canada for education my father and the rest is history. Um, my father's uh, sister was a missionary nurse in Zambia for 35 years and it was a teaching hospital. So one of those graduates started Faith Orphans uh, Fund um, or foundation in Zambia and uh, we got them registered here in Canada uh, for fundraising purposes back 18 years ago. Uh, she makes her sort of annual trips and they just flew in uh, to Toronto when I was flying out here. So she'll be here for about a month. So again, it's really a heart of helping. I mean, people say, oh, you're probably investing a lot in agriculture. And sure, we've had agriculture projects over the years, but it's all about uh, really you know, spread of the gospel really for the poor, the sick and the hungry. And so it's a wide ranging kind of uh, support that we provide, uh, sure, both in Canada, but also around the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So Ian and his family and the company are a great inspiration for us and for many, many others, and uh, bless many, including those of us here today, both by what you've shared and what you've provided. So thank you. And I'm just going to close. He referenced a number of um, words, God's words, in regard to feeding the hungry. And so one of the promises, which I think is great, because I believe that many of you here have a kind of commitment to make a difference for those who are vulnerable and one of the promises says, let's feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. And then we also know later in Proverbs, it says, blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. So may we continue to share that which we've been given and to steward well um, what we've been given also. Que Dieu vous bénisse abondamment. Thank you. Thank you.